wrote in his diary. At 8 p.m., Goff telephoned. Parties of all arms of the enemy are through our reserve line. I concurred on his falling back and defending the line of the Somme. The impossible, the incredible had happened. The Western Front had been broken. As in 1914, a great army was treading the bitter road of retreat with an exultant pursuer at its heels. Haste, confusion, rumors, orders, counter orders, and always the menace of German fire close behind. A staff officer, one of our staff officers, rode up on his horse and said, Now, men, I want you to stand firm on this hillside. You've got a good position, you should be all right. But the men didn't take any notice of him whatsoever. They began to stampede. And they said, We've no chance, sir, we've got no chance whatsoever. The Germans are coming up, they've got tanks. And, he, and so he started appealing to our regiments. And he said to me, I was at, his, at the side of the horse, he said, Men of the East Lancashire Regiment, he said, Now you've got a very good reputation. Well, I thought, well, it's not much good here, is it, sir? And just at that moment, a German tank came up the hillside from the village, come up the hill, and started firing. Well, that started it. The staff officer on his horse got off his marks as quick as he could. March the 23rd. The retreat went on. Peron fell. Behind the slow procession of defeat, the sound of German guns came ever nearer. Along the road, a slow stream of traffic was moving towards Bapom and beyond. First waves of a tide which rolled westwards for days and days. Here and there a battery in column of route, walking wounded in twos and threes. An odd lorry or two. A staff car carrying with undignified speed the dignified sign of corps headquarters. A column of horse transport. I stood watching the unforgettable scene for ten minutes. It was too sad for words. March the 24th. Bapome fell. A gap grew between the 3rd and 5th armies. The 5th army was now only a thin screen of stumbling, exhausted troops. The Allies faced disaster. That day, Haig met Pétain. Pétain told me that he had directed General Féal in the event of the German advance being pressed still further, to fall back south westwards to cover Paris. It was at once clear to me that the effect of this order must be to separate the British from the French and so allow the enemy to penetrate between the two armies. To the Kaiser, this was victory. He decorated Hindenburg with the Iron Cross with Golden Rays, last awarded to Prince Blücher after the Battle of Waterloo. German press echoed the Kaiser's pride. The great battle in the West is won. A large part of the English army is beaten. But Hindenburg realized that the Germans were only halfway to victory. Whole sections of the English front had been utterly routed and were retiring apparently out of hand in the direction of Amiens. If the town fell into our hands, it was possible that the strategic and political interests of France and Britain might drift apart. So forward against Amiens. The Kaiserschlacht, the imperial battle, raged on. The line of gunfire crept ever nearer Amiens. Each side threw every man and gun into the struggle. The Allied air forces flew to the limits of endurance, machine gunning and bombing the advancing German troops. Only time to re-bomb and refill tanks and guns when we land from a raid, then all machines off again on the next. Only the air 
German could scan the whole panorama of battle. The country presents an extraordinary sight from above. Columns of dense smoke going up to 8,000 feet from nearly every town and cottage. Enormous fires from burning stores and dumps. Shells bursting every few yards. Columns of our troops retreating along all main roads and stragglers tramping westwards across the fields. Still the retreat went on. I think we were past hope or despair. We regarded all events with an indifference of weariness, knowing that with the dawn would come another attack. Once again, civilian refugees abandoned their homes and fled from the enemy. On the road, the flood of refugees was tramping along in the midst of a cloud of powdery dust that settled on every one of them. The air was filled with the squeaks of carriages, the smack of whips, and the jingle of cowbells. Haig and Pétain strove to rebuild their shattered line. Hindenburg realized that the battle was becoming a race to Amiens. English reserves from the north, French troops drawn from the whole of central France, were hastening to Amiens and its neighborhood. More reinforcements were on their way from England. Under my office window in the city, there passed this morning as fine a body of men as one could wish to see. They were a draft marching to the station en route to France. The wives and sweethearts of some marched with them. One couldn't watch these sturdy young fellows marching to face the terrors of war without a sense of inexpressible pride. March the 25th. To the men on the crowded roads, it seemed the retreat would never end. In the words of a gunner, we were on the move again with real dismay in our hearts. Officers were ordered to use their revolvers if necessary to check panics. March the 26th. Now the armies were fighting in the wasteland of the old Somme battlefield of 1916. March the 26th, we dropped into a trench. It was a trench we knew of old. We had started to retreat on the 21st of March, 1918. And here we were back in the trench we had started the attack from on November the 13th, 1916. In the shadow of catastrophe, the British High Command looked to the Channel ports. The French looked to Paris. A gulf was opening between the Allies. In Doulon, a drab little town in the path of the German attack, the Allied leaders gathered in an atmosphere of crisis. Haig believed that Pétain had lost his nerve. Pétain believed that the British would be herded into the Channel. Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister, was appalled at Pétain's pessimism. But General Foch was resolute. We must fight in front of Amiens. We must fight where we are now. As we have not been able to stop the Germans on the Somme, we must not now retire a single inch. This was Haig's chance to have the pessimistic Pétain overruled. He took it. If General Foch will consent to give me his advice, I will gladly follow it. The conference broke up. Foch had been made supreme Allied commander in all but name. But the crisis of the imperial battle had already passed. The tidal wave, the rolling force of March the 21st, had spent itself. Five days of marching and fighting without relief. Five days short of water, without proper sleep. Five days.